Hey there. I'm currently walking through the woods north of Atlanta, Georgia. And if I keep walking down this trail, I'm going to reach some sort of area where they store a bunch of unused construction materials. And I believe it's stored by the state or the county. I'm not really sure. This is also an area where they store a bunch of vehicles and stuff. And you might remember me and Richard Devine walking around sampling a bunch of things with Polly and Perks. Kind of the same area. This time there is no really nice camera or camera person either. I'm just bringing my vlog cam and a little mic and a selfie stick. And the reason for that is because not long after I published that video, they put no trespassing signs all over the place. So it is definitely illegal for me to be doing this. Ben, why are you even including this part in the video? You're incriminating yourself. But the thing you don't know is that I'm actually in front of a green screen in my studio. None of this is actually happening. It's all fiction. At this point in the video, you're probably asking yourself why I'm here in the first place. And it's because I want to do some really weird audio experiments with giant corrugated tubes. If you've ever played with one of those toy whirly tube things, you spin them around and it creates the first couple notes from the Jeopardy theme song. Well, why is that? It wasn't designed to do that. It just naturally does. So he set out to prove something that he already knew. That if you held a giant tube outside of a speeding vehicle, it would resonate in fifths. It's actually not a coincidence that this channel occasionally gravitates towards tubes. Tubes are extraordinarily significant in the way that we tune and listen to music today, at least in the West. I'm gonna have the Ben who is not running out of sunlight explain it to you. Hey Ben, good luck out there. So like I mentioned in a previous video, our Western tuning system actually didn't come from some sort of council that met up and decided that God wanted us to write and listen to music a certain way. Actually the opposite. Nature had a lot to do with the Pythagorean standard of tuning. And in early Western religious music, something as simple as a triad was seen as dissonant or even heretic. I'm talking to the camera while sitting on some giant concrete tubes here, and I bet that if I pick up one of these rocks here and bash it against the tube, a tone will come out with a pretty even timbre, and I bet that tone is strikingly close to a note that fits within Western tuning. Corrugated pipes are especially interesting because if you pass air through them, these ridges work as almost a resonant oscillator. And the faster the velocity of the air that you push through the tube, then the higher the harmonic of the fundamental pitch of the tube you get to hear. Now, if you or I were to pick up a little ridge tube or pipe and swing it around, the lowest note that we would likely be able to hear would be the fifth of the fundamental pitch. And that would be a three to two ratio of the fundamental pitch. Now, the ratio between the second highest note and the third would be four to three. If you spin it even faster, you'll hear a higher note and the ratio between the third and fourth note is five to four, and so on. Hey, that's a pretty weird coincidence. The mathematical model of just about everything in nature lines up perfectly with how we listen to music. What? Back to tubes. Now, I know that some of my viewers have smarty pants on and you're getting ready to comment, hey, my acoustics professor said that you actually can't hear the fundamental of a tube by pushing air through it. And he or she is wrong. You actually can, it just isn't that practical. I know some of you are just watching this to hear some cool tube music, and I realize that this gets pretty thick, but you know what else is thick? Air, air is thick. That's how planes fly. They literally glide on the thickness of air. So let's pretend that we are driving a car and the car is air, and we are driving over some speed bumps, and those will be the little bumps in a corrugated pipe. Now, if we go over the speed bumps very, very slowly, we will just go up and down, and it'll barely make a noise, and that is laminar flow. But if we go through those speed bumps at 100 miles an hour, it's gonna go like that, and it'll actually go so fast, it'll probably oscillate and make a tone, and that is turbulent flow. You can actually calculate exactly when air becomes turbulent if the value of Reynolds number goes above 2000. What is Reynolds' number? D is the density of air. V is the velocity of the airflow through the tube in meters per second. The small r is the radius of the tube, and H is the viscosity of the air. I'll be the first to admit that much like the Earth's atmosphere, I am a bit thick, so I might be missing something, and I probably am, but it also is easy to understand how this could be a mystery to somebody involved in acoustics, and this could just be an obvious answer to somebody involved in, I don't know, aerospace engineering. Yay, we're all done with the physics part, and the reason I'm even touching 
touching on that will make sense in a future video, but hopefully it won't matter in this video because hopefully the wind won't get strong enough to make these pipes howl themselves, otherwise I'll have a very bad time out there, but there is something we could do. We could brute force that resonant frequency with a massive bass transducer. And that is contingent on if Ben could get the impulse responses recorded before the sun goes down. Ben, how's it going with that? So the first order of business is I'm going to take my rusty old Zoom H6 here, and I'm going to record some claps in this crazy tube, which sounds like a comb filter. And then I'm also going to record a balloon pop. For those of you who don't already know what I'm doing, that's obviously going to create a bunch of echo and reverb. And we could actually take the tail of that echo and reverb and create something called an impulse response and essentially steal the reverb from this tube and use it in the studio. By the way, I'm recording at 96 kilohertz at 24 bit, and I'm just using the Zoom XY mic with 120 degree separation. There are a whole lot of tubes over this way, and I think they're way longer than that one. And if I have time, I kind of want to go back to that tube and hit all these tubes. I have a transducer and a massive amp and battery in my backpack here that's really heavy and I'd really like to turn these tubes into oscillators today. I keep looking at the sun and getting really nervous. I'm gonna have to hurry up and make this as efficient as possible because I'm not gonna be able to come back for at least four or five days because if you follow the news, there is a hurricane coming. It'll be a tropical storm most likely when it hits this area, but everything's gonna be really rainy and windy and unfilmable for a while. I forgot that these were really sharp. Whew, I have tinnitus. Wait for that bird to be quiet. Now we've reached the point in the video where I'm climbing on top of jagged metal tubes, so wish me luck as I place this one in here. So this is a giant battery by a company that probably doesn't even exist anymore and has started a new name to sell things on Amazon and give themselves fake reviews for. The battery works fine, but that's just how things are these days. This is a four ohm, 50 watt transducer and it is really powerful. It's like a jackhammer. And this is just a dirt cheap 100 watt amp. I'm really only looking for vibration, not audio quality. So I could go as cheap as I could there. And I'm only using one speaker. So 50 watts, 50 watts, we're good. I think I'm just gonna be using a tone generator app on my phone. I brought my iPad, but it's kind of funny. The tone generator selection on Android is like all these really scientifically accurate 100% free tone generators and on Apple it's all these like binaural beat healing tone generator for $9.99 a month and it's just kind of I guess that's what you'd expect. One question I have after climbing around in these tubes for about an hour is when was the last time I got a tetanus shot? Unfortunately, not only is the sun going down, I'm also running out of camera battery. The crickets and the wind are kind of giving me some issues with the audio, but I'm gonna continue recording into the night, and I guess we'll hear whatever I record on the PC session, which uh, should start right about now. All right, so we are in Adobe Audition here, and this is the first balloon pop, apparently. And this would be it right here. Copy this to a new file and let's hear it. All right, so we have crickets clearly and let's just hear those. Yeah, so we could just delete that. We still have that annoying little bird here. So looks like nothing else is occupying the spectrum here. So we could actually 
remove the bird. All right, now let's hear it. I'm gonna call this corrugated pipe large real time. And then I'm gonna save it as a 4816. Okay, so this original file I'm going to copy to new again. And then I'm going to take this and interpret the sample rate down to 48. And it will be much slower and we won't really lose any quality. And that'll actually make a nice, more reverbery comb filter. Some of these claps actually sound really good. Copy to new. I think anybody watching this understands what I'm doing here, so there's no need for me to continue doing it through every single file. I will see you in the DAW. All right, so here we are in just FL Studio. I opened up FPC and made a super sick beat. If anybody wants to buy it from me and use it in their rap track, they can. I just use the uh, default drum kit. <laughs> All right, so there's a million different VST plugins that load impulse responses and do convolution. Some are really amazing, some are not so amazing. I'm just gonna use the FL Studio one and maybe the Melda one. Um, I really haven't opened the FL Studio one in a while. It should be under Reverb, yeah, Convolver, there it is. You could do a lot worse than the FL Studio one. Um, they make it pretty easy to understand exactly what's going on. So like here is just the original um, sample that is in this impulse, right? And so you can actually play with it in real time. And I'm just gonna load up one of mine. Um, let's load in the corrugated pipe real time. All right, here we go. So now let's pump the drums through it. There we go, now we're playing drums in a pipe. And there's also an EQ. You can also add in delay. So uh, here I'm gonna bring the beat down to 120 BPM and then the delay time, we could go up to 500 milliseconds. Um, the only reason I'm doing that is 500 milliseconds is a quarter note at 120. So let's hear that. Yeah, let's try this crazy one. This one actually has a nice bass note to it. Another thing that you can do that is completely ridiculous in this setting is self-convolve. That kind of makes everything more intense. However, if you're doing it with a resonant tone that's like a comb filter like this, then the self-convolution is going to sound it's just going to create feedback in that tone and so it would almost be as if we were to play this inside that same pipe from the exact same location all right let's do this Most convolution reverbs come with somewhat of a library, and so you can do a lot of stuff. Like, here's a church. Um, I'm going to lower the volume here. But. So, yeah, playing in a church. And that actually sounds like a really good reverb, and it is. It's actually a reverb from a real place. Like, ride cymbals and stuff like that, and it'll sound almost as if you have a ride playing along with the beat just automatically. It's like a good way to just fake that um it also some symbols also have some really good reverb to them if you take off the high end yeah if you play around with symbols and the eq long enough you could actually make it sound like one of those old school radio shack spring reverb units or something similar to that or you could just you know use an impulse from one of those devices which i'm sure there are plenty of one thing that i spent way more time doing was putting a transducer on all of those pipes and getting the resonant frequencies and now it's time to play with that. All right, so back in Audition, I believe that they're both in these two files here. They're gonna take a minute to open because they've been recorded at 24-bit. All right, so this is the first one. Oh, that's so creepy. I was doing a lot of weird FM modulation stuff with the resonant frequencies. 
In this file I spent about 15 minutes trying to make a chord. And so here I saved a bunch of frequencies and then I just sort of scrolled through them on my phone and tried to make a bass loop. All right, so let's pick out the notes for chords and then we'll just find that loop later. So the notes. I could be a lot less satisfied with the way that that turned out. I think it sounds really cool, particularly when wearing nice headphones. What do you think? Every time I hike back to this place, more and more of these giant corrugated sewer tubes are showing up and they are just begging for more audio experimentation. And I really want to get a camera person and Richard Devine down there, but first I need some sort of official permission. And yeah, I emailed some people from my county and I never heard back. I called somebody from a park district because there's a park very nearby and this guy didn't even know that the park existed. So I'm gonna keep trying, hopefully, but you know. Well, all right, partner, I reckon that's enough. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel. If there's anything you want me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments. If you wanna support this channel, you can check out my band camp in the description below. I have like 25 hours of music that you could buy and uh, Eh, you know what, the video's done. Let's sit around and rap for a second, just you and me. Obviously the band camp thing isn't making me that much money. YouTube advertising doesn't pay barely anything. I had the Curiosity Stream affiliate partnership going for a little bit and I really do love the Curiosity Stream network, but it was just kind of hard to deal with. It was these like ominous URLs and they wouldn't give me my own URL or a code or anything like that. And then they went ahead and gave one of my competitors a custom URL and a discount code, a really good discount code, where you could get it much cheaper through his channel. I don't think that this documentary network that I brought hundreds of subscribers to could possibly send a message to me that would tell me that they value me any less. So as I'm starting to find my own path and making more sciency and soundscapey videos, and also spending money on making these videos, Patreon is starting to make a little bit more sense because in a video like this, you could actually download all the content that I sample. And this is just a fundamental quirk with me. I completely support the Patreon economy. Everybody who uses Patreon, Patreon itself, I think it's a great idea and I think it's produced a whole bunch of amazing stuff. But for me personally, I almost feel like it's too close to asking for donations. Musically, I've always looked at it this way. Like if I make an album and it doesn't make money, then I failed at making an album and then I'm not a professional musician anymore. And the same thing with this channel. Like if I'm not making enough money to just keep this channel going, then I've failed and then the channel's over and I move on to the next thing. But that's such a boneheaded way of looking at things. So let me know what you think. I wanna hear your opinion. What do you think of Patreon? Are there any other competitors or any other things that you could think of that might be better? How much would you pay for your tier with Patreon? Should I do it per month or per video? I wanna know what you guys think. All right, thanks for watching, bye.